Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us on episode one, A Breath of Fresh Air. My name is Ben Wiggins, and I'm here with Dr. Michael Seitz. Dr. Michael, how are you doing today? Very good, thank you. I want to take a few moments to kind of bring us in, establish a little credibility both for myself and for Dr. Seitz. So a few few things on me. I'm, again, my name is Ben Wiggins, and I'm the host of the Mays Mastercast for Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. I'm also the Chief Investment Officer for Calumet Investment Partners, which is a, a public stock fund in Bryan, Texas. And uh, my journey to meeting Dr. Seitz has been kind of a long and circuitous one. I spent a few years working in sports and then learned about the art of storytelling while living on the West Coast and working as an independent film producer and television writer uh, uh, in North Los Angeles. Burbank, working with some of the studios around there, and then moved to Texas in 2015, began working at the stock fund at that time, and completed an MBA at Mays Business School during that time. The inception of the Mays Mastercast, where Michael and I met, was uh, I pitched the show to the university, to the business school and began hosting it for them. We started the show on spec and have been very fortunate to experience some uh, pretty decent success with the show where we feel very fortunate and very, uh, very uh, lucky to be where we are. So that sort of brings us to where Michael and I met. Blue Sky Global was uh, had a very important message to get out into the world, especially especially around the time of uh, when COVID was first kind of ramping up. And we reached out to Dr. Seitz and to his team, uh, James Pruitt, uh, was a big piece of making that happen as well. So shout, shout out to James. But we wanted to hear a little bit more about what Blue Sky is doing in the clean air space. There was a lot of confusion at the time around how COVID was spread, whether it was through, whether it was through contact or whether it was through the air. And a lot of what we suspected at the time has borne out to be true. But I'd like to give the audience a chance to get to know you a little bit, Dr. Seitz, and to kind of get a sense of what we can expect to learn on this show, what, what they should be expecting to hear from us and especially from you. Let's talk a little bit about, well, let's start by talking about most interesting thing that the audience needs to know about you that they might not know yet. Huh. What they need to know about me is that um, I'm always looking at ways of reimagining things we think are normal, especially yeah. the things that we really consider normal. Yeah. Um, so it's it's stuff we take for granted. I love just my my brain naturally goes to thinking about those things more than the frontier stuff, mm -hmm. which naturally everybody's trying to advance that frontier. I'm kind of looking at the stuff that's well-established, doesn't need to be questioned. Yes, it's one of my favorite things <laughs> about disruption, you. disruption, right? <laughs> yes, disruption, a, a true a true iconoclast in the best possible way. What tell, tell our viewers a little bit about your background and how it's led to the founding of Blue Sky, if you would. So um, I grew up in South Africa. Yeah. And... South Africa was in a unique situation during the apartheid years where uh, the country was very isolated. Yeah. And so engineering um, was a big part of the South Africa's survival requirement that we did our own engineering that because we were just cut off from everything. It was the same in the arts, music, everything. So as a result, and with the big mining industry there, um, Engineering was something that we really strived to to do well, and I became an engineer. I studied engineering. I went on to do a PhD. That was n had very little to do what I actually ended up doing in my career. I immediately started my own business, actually, in a medical field. So I didn't even end up going into mechanical engineering, which is what I studied. Right. Um, but in the process of trying to survive and do consulting work, I ended up um, doing doing some work automating welding processes. So I got mm. an early touch onto mechanizing, automating uh, very, very large welding projects that were ad hoc, you know, one or two big pieces that needed something specially designed. Yeah. And that brought me into the field of metals. 
and um, I designed new equipment in that. I actually owned that company, sold it later. Mm -hmm. And um, as part of that, we got into metal spraying, mm -hmm. developed equipment for metal spraying, some patents. The business really grew, came to the U.S. And part of that metal spraying process, we're obviously doing that so we can protect something from, say, corrosion or erosion, high temperature corrosion. Yeah. But in the process of doing the work, it generates a lot of dust. <laughs> yeah. Because you're sandblasting, you're getting rid of whatever's on the surface before. Yeah. And um, the application itself, the metal spraying, produces metal fume. As you've said, the generally there's this kind of acceptance that, you know, that whatever is in the air around us is just sort of something that we accept and move on. What do you think is most important about helping people, helping our society, helping our society parse a little more finely what we should accept and what we shouldn't accept? Does that question make sense? Yeah, it does. And it's philosophically... Yeah, you know, there's various ways to go after it. So one is educating the people who are in the workplace that yeah. what's happening is not good for them. Yeah, uh, that could even go all the way to you know educating the unions who represent them. Yeah, it's not a very effective system, though, believe it or not, because a lot of the people that are doing the work that is dangerous need that work. Yeah, um, they're not going to get very far by throwing down their tools and demanding clean air. It's very hard. Right. So, unfortunately, it has to be a top down pressure to say first of all from an education point of view um i want to stop there and just think about an analogy actually think about smoking sure it's probably one of the areas that has made us so oblivious to how we do lung damage because you smoke you do this and like you can go on smoking for 20 years and very few consequences of that behavior right but as you get older um you start you know suffering and um my father died of lung cancer at 57. He was a heavy smoker. Hmm. Um, so it's really about the people that are at the late stage of the game who are now senior executives in a company or know better or the government to essentially enforce good behavior. Put hmm. your sunscreen on. <laughs> we, we mentioned James Pruitt earlier, and hmm. uh, I know that he has a very personal story around all of this do you care to share any very details? sad yes so james's dad was in construction hmm. so he was exposed to a construction typical dust whether that be cement dust or wood mm -hmm. sawdust which seems so benign um, he died of an occupational lung disease he started uh, getting fibrosis of the lungs hmm. which became uh, progressive so just just briefly what happens when you breathe a lot of dust in it irritates your lungs mm. that creates low-grade inflate uh, inflammation yeah, so it's okay. continuously red it's like you're continuously scratching gotcha. but it's in your lungs um, inflammation is not a good thing when something is continuously inflamed it starts getting reactive blah 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 so it that decreases your quality of life you start developing mucus blah blah you feel congested so the early stages of of lung damage are normally just dropping of quality of life later on um, as you breathe in certain particles they actually damage your very fine alveoli especially the very very fine dust the stuff you can't see right goes into your deep lung and it just scratches it it maybe makes a little cut if it's silica it can make a little cut and that heals very rapidly but you get scar tissue hmm. and the problem with scar tissue in the lungs is um, it makes your lung hard it doesn't work it's scar tissue mm -hmm. it's not good tissue and systematically, um, the scar tissue builds up. So it's 1%, then it's 2%, then it's 3%. Your lungs are perfectly whole, but they no longer function properly. So you lose lung capacity mm -hmm. and they become more and more hard, which means it's harder to breathe or breathe out. And then over time, it goes to 5, 10, 15, and it has this tendency to accelerate. Because as you're struggling to breathe, you can also breathe it deeper into your lungs. And so James's father, he basically couldn't take a breath anymore. So he died from destroyed lungs. And it's a miserable, progressive uh, end of life. It's horrible. Hmm. Can you imagine not being able to breathe? Uh, and there's no turning back. 
Yeah. It's slow too. Yeah. That's awful. And that's really what drives me so hard is that my father dying of lung cancer and that whole, and you have to stop it early. It's, it's you know, once, once you're in your 50s or 60s, it's game over. Yeah. So then you moved to thinking about cleaning the air and what, um, what, what, what set you off along that course of action? Okay, so I did not have these thoughts that I'm sharing with you now is as I'm older and I'm, going, and I'm wiser, right? I've got skin cancer. Oh, goodness, I need to tell my kids to put on sunscreen. <laughs> that analogy is kind of still working. <laughs> right. Um, so we were working in this metal spraying industry and the laws changed around hexavalent chrome. We had a chrome containing metal that we sprayed. Mm -hmm. And the permissible emissions and what people could breathe in dropped by an order of magnitude, uh, three orders of magnitude. It went from milligrams to micrograms. Right. Very, very low concentrations. Yes. Which meant this was now no longer a case of just masks. We had to do environmental controls. We had to stop emissions. We had to do use dust collectors. Hmm. So what are dust collectors? Blah, blah, blah. We did field work, so started running around trying to find these things. And the hexavalent chrome is a unique type of dust in that it's it's really got a tendency to clog filters oh. so you could buy filtration machines but the hexavalent chrome would just destroy them in a shift the filters just completely done so that was the first practical thing i realized is these dust collectors don't exist for this class of dust which is okay. quite bizarre hexavalent chrome is produced in grinding welding everything and there aren't dust collectors that can deal with it that can go out to job sites because it, it binds to the filter in a way that other dust doesn't it's, or? it's very small so the hexavalent chrome particle in itself looks a little bit like a snowflake under okay. a microscope yeah. and so it gets stuck in the fabric uh -huh. it's got an electrostatic type of effect too okay so it's a very sticky dust right. very fine and just builds up quite quickly and then can't be released and it just clogs up everything right and then it's mixed in with other dust usually but it really really clogs up everything okay okay so we had this Practical issue that these dust collectors, we took them out on the job sites and they just wouldn't work, period. We even had a dust collector in our workshop that we had to install and that had the same problems. Hmm. So my first re realization was we need a machine that works. And so I figured out how to make this machine work, what was going on. We got some of the more traditional dust collector people at that time to come in, Donaldson companies like that. And, you know, it was an air-to-cloth ratio thing. But the hexavalent dust at that point of thermal spraying it was still really new territory. Okay. So I figured out what needed to be done there. And then the second thing that was really, really problematic for me was the collected dust itself. So you collect all the stuff out of the air, and now you end up with barrels and barrels of this dust. Um, and just disconnecting the chutes to take the barrels away to change. Sure. Um, it's quite dangerous. We had some incidents happening where that dust would, you know, fall out, get on people's hands. I'd call them the green men. Their Tyvek suits, everything would be green. Right. They'd come into the washroom, wash it. It was just a total mess. And so um, I used to make the joke, it's disgusting, but, you know, hey, guys, it's time to go and change the porta potty get your <laughs> shovels. Because here we were collecting all this horrible, horrible dust. It's like talcum powder. It just gets on everywhere. Mm. It gets into the pores of your skin. It, it makes your eyes water. It's, got, it's just terrible stuff. It's, but you've got to change the filters. You've got to change everything. And it was terrifying for me to watch these, day, you know, watch these men dealing with it. So we had an incident in Canada, um, remembering this, the you know, where we had to do a filter change and we had to remove the dust and um, it was dropped. Hmm. And the problems it caused. And again, it was just striking to me. is Why, why, why are we going in and handling dirty filters, have to open up, change the drums? This should all be encapsulated. This hmm. should not be open. Yeah, You should do it away from the job site. You can do it later on under controlled conditions when you have time. Yeah. Not when it's raining, the wind is blowing, it's hot, it's cold, whatever. Right. This is all nonsense. This thing has not been, you know, implemented correctly. Right. And um, so those were the two things. I wanted something that was really robust, could be transported to the field and work with these hard dusts, these hazardous dusts. Yeah. And then be easily serviceable. Nobody touches the filters. None of that going on. 
Okay. And uh, that was essentially the core of of the Blue Sky invention. The, you know, the business itself was a whole new paradigm, but for my own use, I invented that dust collector and we used it for years and years and years successfully hmm. and all what, over the world. And, and what was the most... So the most fundamental value proposition of that dust collector was that the, the it was it was really easy to change out and to to change out the filters to dispose of the filters. What so describe is right. So the core value was a that it could be taken to a job site. Yeah, and left at a job site. We even used them at our workshop. Okay, so we had a very robust machine that was easy to keep going. Yeah. And number two, which was kind of my critical point, was that it did not require servicing in the traditional way. No person should ever have to grab a large, dirty filter okay. on a job site. And that could even be a fixed installation. A lot of these dust collectors are outside. You know, Ben, there are some... They're, they're an older class of dust collectors. they call bag houses. Hmm. These are long bags. You have men going into these long bag houses and pulling out. So you know your vacuum cleaner filter? Yeah. They go and they pull out these giant things covered in the dust that nobody wants to breathe in. Oof. They spend eight hours doing that. And it doesn't have to be done that way. Hmm. That can all be encapsulated. Why on earth would you do it that way? Right. What were some of the biggest challenges around getting getting the machine like you wanted it to be i mean inventing this must have been it's tricky because as easy as it is to say encapsulated right um so i broke it up into modular components and figured out how these things could be stacked vertically and side by side so that they would function that's where my kind of mechanical engineering really helps me okay because um it has to be a very practical lego set at the end of that it has to all clip <laughs> together and, yeah. and work and then to change our pieces, you have to be able to pull them apart. It all has to work seamlessly. Right. Um, so figuring out the logic flow, the th it's very 3D because it goes around channels. You've got to... Um, and if you build the Lego tower wrong, it falls over and then your exactly. toddler's upset. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so it was that was just a fun Rubik's Cube. It okay. was literally a Rubik's Cube, solving the Rubik's Cube. Sure. So I had what I wanted to be, where I wanted to arrive, the completed Rubik's Cube, now and then started messing around. Yeah. And that was quite a long process, actually. Okay. Because certain things were tried, then that was it worked, but it wasn't that practical. Then we got practical things, but they didn't work so well, they weren't as reliable. And so Okay. Then so you invented this thing and uh, and it was working really well for you. You guys used it for years and years mm -hmm. at these job sites. And then when did you what what happened what happened then? Okay, so I sold the business. <clears throat> it's now uh, to General Electric or Alstom Power, which became General Electric. Yeah. Or they were bought by General Electric. Um, as part of that transaction, I retained the patents for the dust collectors. Okay. And continued to develop as a hobby because to me this was really um, an important passion for me and – it was always going to be where I would, what I would do next in life. You know, when my transition period, I I just stay five years. Yeah. Once that was over, my idea was to then move into dust collection full time. Okay. And so I started working on that, and that's where the business, how to build it into a business, rather than just something you use yourself. And there were some key aspects that I brought in as part of that um, development, which is as an example. Um, it's we were using it for thermal spray, but if you need it for silica or you need it for lead dust, you know, lead paint abatement or, you know, in a train yard or something like that, mm -hmm. how are you going to move this thing? Do you need a special truck? What do you do? How do you dump it? All those things came into play. Mm -hmm. And that's where then the third critical thing of Blue Sky is that, um, you know, the, the whole dust collector ends up on a roll-off. So the standard waste management type of waste service vehicle because my vision is that ultimately all companies in the future can rent the air cleaning service in the same way you do your solid waste. Hmm. You call up a waste management company. Yeah. 
and um, they bring the machine on their truck. They put it down. You plug it in like a compactor would be, say. Right. Or a, just a, a bin, one of these big things. Sure. Um, it's run. It's connected to the ducting that's in your factory or to your job site if you're doing shutdowns or whatever you're doing. Yeah. Uh, or road construction. Take so many examples, Navy ships. And then when the job's done, that truck rolls in, picks it up, takes it off to landfill, treats it in the right way, correct documentation. So that ultimately the whole service globally can be provided by um, a waste management company. They have the equipment, they have the waste hauling, they have the machines, and um, you just rent them on a month by month basis as a service. In the name of a breath of fresh air. Exactly. So what, uh, let's talk briefly. I, I want to give our viewers an opportunity to go to bluesky-global.com and to uh, avail yourselves of the resources you may find there, including contact information. Um, but Michael, let's, uh, so let's move briefly into talking about kind of the, where, where Blue Sky has come forward unto now um, and what is, you know, what, what is, what's available and where is the frontier and then we'll uh, we'll round out our first uh, our first discussion here if that's okay with you perfect so um when i left uh, ge mm -hmm. i consolidated the basic designs built the first full-scale prototypes right got a couple of pilot projects going so that was about a two-year process mm -hmm. um because it went from blueprint and patented all the way to a machine that could be installed in some factories. So we did that, um, ran those for a while, looked good. And then we were essentially ready to launch in the US mm -hmm. uh, together with some, some other folks that were partners and COVID hit. Right. And um, we, for instance, had an order with Nucor, things like that, and they were canceled mm. or they were put on hold. Yeah. Um, COVID. I and this is where you and I were speaking right at the beginning. Right. I had immediately just based on some of the analysis and research I did, I realized that COVID was in the air. Washing our hands wasn't going to do it. It wasn't coming. We weren't sneezing on each other. Right. It was in the breathing air. And um I was sitting with a machine, big machines that could go to public spaces, schools, emergency rooms, important meeting rooms, blah blah. And I thought, wow. Um, this is important, and I tried to talk about it a lot. Um, we went to see, you know, we went to the government, we went everywhere, mm -hmm. but nobody would really, I wouldn't say they wouldn't listen, but they go, very interesting, but we're not sure. So there was a lot of hesitancy, there was a lot of pushback, because at that stage, acknowledging that it was in the air and that these machines could work, meant that you were then committed to, you know, some serious investment. And so it was it was a total disaster. We I developed certain size different sizes of these machines specifically for for COVID filtering a HEPA with UV to sterilize the filters automatically, everything. We put one in a dentist's office, we put one in a school, um, in a restaurant, um, in a big um, const um, assembly area for a car manufacturer. Yeah demonstrate we even did the testing it really it was amazing it was the right solution at the right place and we didn't have a single taker hmm. never not not didn't even sell one not a single sale so um with that spent a lot of treasure energy and and it was tough knowing that this was something that could have helped a lot of the areas that needed it yeah but not being able to make the case for it then, um, as the pandemic has now slowed, really just pivoting back to our original business um, with rental machines, yeah, ready to rent, doing a pilot of the of the basic global rollout. So the U.S. is is the focal point with several machines here, um, really available. We've had some um, very important clients already um, with good results. So now it's a question of um, for for the folks out there just to know that the equipment's available to be rented. Mm -hmm. And then also to begin to find um, in, investors to build these fleets out, to put them in California, to put them in Alaska, Canada, um, just roll the machines out on a greater scale 
uh, to make them available locally where there's you know need. Mm. And what is what is the current version of the servicing process? You mentioned your vision for kind of the far the the future the future version of servicing, but how does it work right now? So at the moment, Blue Sky is. Um, like the control tower, so re rent directly from us or from a re-renter. We've we've allowed uh, certain companies like United Rental, um, some other businesses that have rented from us and then re-rented them to other clients. Mm -hmm. So that's the one model, or directly from us. And then we use a waste management company and independent trucking companies to haul the equipment around. Okay, but it would be far more efficient that it all ended up in the hands of the waste hauler. Right, not having these multiple parties. Sure, sure. No, that makes sense. How does how does someone try out the system? What's the? It's as simple as going to our website. Yeah. Uh, there's That's the telephone numbers. Blue Sky Global dot com. Correct. Um, there will be telephone numbers, uh, contact form for email, and um, just you know very briefly tell us what's going on. Then we'll ask a few questions and. We're off to the races. That's great. What last last question? Um, what do you consider this industry will look like even farther down the road? Um, you talked about your vision for kind of where this goes. What is what what is the in from a the biggest possible perspective? Where do we eventually end up? So for Blue Sky, where I would like to see us ending up is that we have some key manufacturers who build the equipment. Mm -hmm. We have a distribution network to make it available um, regionally and globally. Mm -hmm. And then the servicing companies, the waste management companies or the rental companies that provide that service for, the, for industry and the public to either rent, long-term lease. And that it becomes just a basic requirement just as we want clean water where we work clean toilets you know safe safety that having the air where you are standing and working continuously cleaned of of the byproduct of the factory that that becomes a no-brainer that we just as at home we want clean air in our homes when we're sleeping at night that we that we're in a situation where the air in the in the working environment is not only cooled that we're comfortable, but is filtered and no longer has any of that stuff in that we don't want in our lungs. And that it's, there's a machine outside that's safely collecting it. And when it's time to be serviced, it gets hauled off and replaced with a new one, like the propane tank ex exchange type deal. I love it. A bright new world. So, and a breath a healthy, of fresh air. A healthy, fresh breath of fresh air. Yes. Exactly. Michael, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. That'll close out our first episode, and we look forward to uh, look forward to more. Thank you, Ben. It's fun talking. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.